Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Mickey, this is Mick Flippins. Today we're going to be doing a bit of an educational style video, I guess. One of my favorite things to buy and sell on eBay, or anywhere really, is uh, military patches. Uh, specifically World War II. Um, which is a proverbial minefield of variants, uh, styles, fakes, reproductions, there's dozens, hundreds of patches uh, out there, uh, very collected, very highly collected by a lot of people, and some are worth thousands of dollars, if you know what you're looking for, and it's uh, definitely, like I said, a minefield of it's like anything if you're going to be buying and selling or collecting you want to do your research and knowledge is power in collecting buying and selling uh so i would highly suggest getting reference material as well like um like uh, this book here this is a good one just for reference style this is a U.S. Military Patches of World War II by Christopher P. Brown. It's got some... Uh, uh, this is good for identification of units and uh, the styles and... Uh, not so much the variants, but a good way to identify patches that you have that you may not know what they're signifying because there's divisional patches, core patches, army patches, which a uh, division makes a core, a core makes or several divisions, three divisions, whatever, make a core, a core makes an army, there's several armies within the army, which that's when it starts getting a little weird and confusing for most people, obviously. So, and there's also some other really great books that I would suggest, you know, by uh, William and Kurt Keller, They've released it. Uh, they've they've published. I don't know, probably at least ten books on pretty much World War Two patches alone, and they definitely have some of the best info, great pictures, um, and again, these are really good for reference and identification. Um, and they do talk about variants and theater made whatnot because that's the. The rabbit hole we're going to travel down right now is I'm going to talk to you about variants. Um, let's see, I got a bunch in front of me right here, so I'm just going to grab one. Like variants, a good, a perfect example here is we got two of the same patches. On this side, they look identical. Turn them around, you got one is green, one has a white back. Uh, to collectors, the greenback is more sought after, slightly, and can raise the price a little bit on most patches, not all. Um, well, I, I mean, it will raise the patches, the price on all patches, whether it's a huge pr difference in price, it, it all depends on the division itself. Uh, but that's just a different style of the way they were manufactured with what we, what was on the bobbin or whatever. Um, but these are the harder to find variants by far. Uh, so there's one style of variant. Then you got bullion, which is another style uh, of patches or a way as patches made. If you see, it's probably not going to zoom very well with the GoPro. But uh, I see that this wreath is basically a metallic uh, style of thread, which is would be called bullion. And this one, I don't think this one is theater made. There's a common misconception: bullion means theater made. I don't think that's entirely true because I'm pretty sure we did, the U.S. did make some of our own insignia in bullion, and I think this would be a, an example of that. Um, Let's see, embroidered, like this is your standard embroidered patch, SSI, and that's another thing we should go over to terms. If you're going to be buying and selling, if you've bought and sold patches in the past, or if you've bought and you 
have patches, you're not so sure what to do with it. And you looked up on eBay and you see terms like SSI, no glow, theater made, um, stuff like that. Uh, what it's referring to is SSI stands for sing, uh, shoulder sleeve insignia. No glow refers to the black light test, uh, which is a test most patch collectors will know very well. And most antique dealers probably have one of these handy anyway for uranium glass or whatever. So, and that's another way to test patches. Uh, that's it's, a, it's in the, uh, the threading. Modern patches will glow. I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, I have a bunch in front of me that'll show us kind of uh, 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 just different variations of different patches from World War One to to now, basically. So, but that's uh, a good test right there, uh, and that's where you'll see listings saying no glow because after World War Two, the patches were made with a different style of or different material of threading which under a black light glows that being said the black light test isn't a perfect surefire way it's a it's a great first step in testing patches um let's see one of your more sought after styles are always going to be airborne those are the most highly sought after that in air core air core squadron patches uh, which do I, have a, I don't have a World War II squadron patch, but I got a Vietnam era squadron patch, which squadron patches will be bigger, usually round, and they're made to kind of go like that on your uniform. Hence, the SSI, the shoulder sleeve insignias, were small, made to go on the shoulder. Um, I'm just kind of rambling. I didn't have any real script for this, so I'm just kind of rolling with it here. This is the 17th Airborne. It's missing its tab, so that's another term you'll probably see in listings with tab without tab and that usually refers to airborne uh, because they would have tabs which this is the airborne tab which and again with variations there will be styles of most airborne patches uh, with the tab attached without it attached um, somewhere they're all one piece where they've been sewn together Soldiers had unique ways of sewing them on, unique ways, which that's another thing that'll drive certain prices, the way of patches even stitched on will actually make a difference in price, believe it or not. And uh, let's see, World War One. I'll do a little history on patches. The army started using patches from World War One to distinguish the different units, especially while on the battlefield and for... Uh, the higher ops generals to be able to identify their soldiers so and here we have a couple styles of world war one uh, patches again that's a whole other would be a whole other video of world war one patches alone which i'm just starting to learn more about world war one patches myself i've been more of a world war ii collector but again they're just they're a minefield of uh, no uh, fakes and stuff out there with anything that's collected really these days and, but this I think this was third core third core one two three so that makes sense and most World War one patches will be on a bull OD material of some form but not all like this one here which I believe is a French made example because uh, we, during World War One and Two, we would end up having our patches made by locals, whether it been be from uh, short supply, we didn't have enough to go around to ship overseas, or the unit just preferred to have that done. Um, but and so, so here's a, this isn't a patch, but it's a good example of a World War One style of embroidery that you would see on what is called the Liberty Loan style patches, which were patches that we sold to raise money uh, for the war. And I think they sold them to civilians. Again, 
I'm learning my World War One patches. Let's see. Um, then, like I said, you got embroidered, hand embroidered, chain stitch, bullion stitch, hand stitched. Like here's a good example of chain stitching. This is a civilian pilot's training wing, uh, which bears a very similar resemblance to World War II pilot cadet wings. Um, but yeah, let's take a little closer look at the patches themselves. One of the best patches out there that's going to help me showcase variants is the CBI patch, which is what this is what they look like. And CBI stands for China, Burma, India which was in the Pacific Theater of Operations. And this is one of the, and there's, these are all pretty much all theater made, um, which is a term uh, I said earlier, but what theater made really means is it was made in theater, whether it had been the European Theater of Operations or the Pacific Theater of Operations or the Mediterranean Theater of Operations. I've seen examples of U.S. patches made by Germany post-war, of course, um, which I have one right here. This is a German-made patch, so this is probably from the 1945 to 1950s, somewhere around there. Uh, also, Japan, uh, Italy, Brit uh, England, uh, France... And I'm sure I'm missing some, uh, but in theater main is a thing that I think it, it, it still goes on today. Went on in Vietnam, uh, what some people would call Mama San patches. Uh, but yeah, back to the CBI patch uh, variants. Let's see. Here alone, I have one, two, three four, five, six, six different variants of the same patch. So, let's take a look at those. Like I said, here is six completely different variants of the exact same patch. Uh, let's see, let's start with this guy here because he's pretty much the most basic. So, and what I mean by variants, like these two, again, yes, they look very similar, but they're constructed different. Uh, see on the backs here. Their style, these are handmade, probably out of machine, but these are handmade. So that'll explain the difference in construction. It depends on where and when it was made. So those are two good examples another good example here we have two different styles of bullion theater made china burma india patch india patches um these ones aren't in the best of condition but they'll serve their purpose for this video Let's see how the uh Bullion goes down here, goes across here. It's a little tighter on some areas than the other one. And we'll look at the backs. Again, just two completely different styles. Now, the bullion style, they're going to be the more sought after style. Um, and more collected. Uh, generally, bullion patches are worth more. Um, CBI, the problem with CBI patches is they are fairly common. So they're going to be your probably your most common theater-made patch to find by far. But I will still pick them up any chance I get. Like a style like this one and this one, if they were in better condition... It'd probably be in the forty to fifty dollar range each, which isn't too bad. Ripped a little piece of fabric. Um, this would be the best one. This one is a leather made leather theater made patch. Now this one is broken, unfortunately, and I kind of glued it back together there. It broke right across this line, so that's unfortunate. But this is a good. This would have been a 
perfect example prime example of a leather china burma india patch and how it was you can just see its inconsistencies and uh, and you just know it was made by hand and another variant here we have very similar to these probably started off like these and then somebody probably did that by hand stitched in the, the uh the star and the uh, sunburst there. So there we have the China Burma India variants. So let's get rolling over here. Here is just a hodgepodge of patches. I just grabbed most of what I had laying around and threw it out here just to kind of show you different examples. So let's uh, you've seen that I showed you the CBI patches. So let's go. I showed you this one earlier too. Again, that was, I believe, the third core World War One. This World War One patch here. This AS stands for Advance Sector. Here we have the one that I showed you earlier. This is a meritorious cit unit citation patch. That would have been on the lower sleeve. We have 17th Airborne. Uh, again, I mentioned this would it's missing a tab. It would have had a tab. Almost identical. Pretty much the same as the 101st Airborne one I just stole that from. And it would have looked like that. And again, these have come in many di different kinds of variations. Um, attached tab, not attached tab. Integral patch where there's like a bit of... Uh, khaki holding the two together um bullion made ones most of these patches like the cbi patches would have had could have would have and could have bullion style now if i had a bullion 17th airborne patch done like this we'd be talking big bucks because airborne very sought after, very collected. As it sits, this is like a ten to ten to twenty dollar patch as it sits. So little things can make a big difference. Okay, here's a good example of what I would say is a German made style patch. This is World War Two or probably post World War Two Navy Minesweeper Command. This is pretty neat because Navy doesn't use patches today from what I understand. And neither does the Marine Corps. Uh, so, I did, and I don't have any Marine Corps examples here. But that's a whole other ball field of stuff. Uh, or, that's a whole other, it's a whole other horse of different colors, I guess. The Marine Corps patches, they had their own style, which they used mainly kind of around World War II, World War I. Um, they still have divisional patches, they just don't wear them on their uniforms, from what I understand today. So, but yes, okay, so here we have the big red one. The 1st Infantry Division, and this is a World War II style, I believe. I, I haven't ran this under the black light. We will later, but that looks to be from here. A uh, good way to tell without a black light, if you have a more modern patch, is... Perfect. I don't really have any modern patches. Ah, perfect, okay. Like this, so you're going to have like this film on the back, which is some cases an iron-on material, so you can iron-on patches. Most modern military patches, from what I've seen, not all, most, will have this plasticky film on the back, where original World War II patches would just be a plain uh, matty cloth right there, like that. So, uh, but again, different variations of everything. So, and the Ghostbuster is obviously not military, but that's going to be a good way to show you the black light later, believe me. 
So is this one. This is a Vietnam era. This is probably 60s or 70s. This is uh, another Navy one. This is um, the 8th Mobile Construction Battalion. Now, that'd be Seabees. And this might be a theater-made version from the embroidery. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, it's one of those things, the more you look at stuff, the more you kind of pick up on certain things. And again, the books really come in handy for that kind of stuff. Here we have, this is a World War I era, 8th Army patch, 8th Army. Um, not 8th Division, 8th Army. Again, I think possibly German made. So, this patch, this is probably a $30 to $40 patch. Uh, uh, I should be giving you a couple prices here. I think one of it is, yeah, the, uh, CBI, the only reason CBI is not worth a ton of money, like I said, it's just the most common style of theater-made patch you're going to find. So it's a great way to show you examples of the variations, but like I said, in good condition, these would probably be in the $50 to $75 range. This is... This one's a really nice one. This is probably more like a $30 to $40 in this condition. And this, I'd say in the $25 to $40 range on these styles. All depends, you know. And this one I have listed currently for $20, but uh, and that's because it's broken. If this wasn't broken, a good, nice leather variant would be... Probably in the $75, north of $75, so maybe $100 or more. And let's see. This is actually a postal worker patch. Another one I just brought in to do a black light test with. Here we have the Ranger Battalion. 4th Ranger Battalion. This one's probably a World War II era patch. But this was a scroll patch. They eventually changed to the Sunoco patch, like you see in Saving Private Ryan, which I have a variant of somewhere of around here. But uh, and this is a newer version of the same patch. Uh, let's see. Here is a nice German-made bullion Germany e tab, and. I know it's German made, not just because of it says Germany on it, but just the style of bullion. Again, it's something you will learn from books or just looking at a couple thousand patches. And we have a nice 11th Airborne with, with its tab. Again, these can come either with them attached, without them attached. And then, 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 uh, here, if you ever come across anything like this, these are Parachute Infantry Regiment Ovals. Uh, these would have sat on the chest. Oh, I will show you. Uh, I got my shadow on there, but there you'll see a PIR oval on an actual uniform. This is a uniform that I have dedicated to my great uncle. It's made up of components of his original stuff. Like that is his original overseas cap. And that is his original 17th Airborne patch. That's his original pair of jump wings and his combat infantry badge. The jacket I sourced and put the accoutrements on just for fun and to make a cool display like this and that's a 517th parachute regimental combat team patch which i should have over there but i forgot i had it to be honest with you but we'll talk about that in a minute i just wanted to show you the oval that signifies the regiment of the 517th and this is an airborne only kind of patch you would see this on airborne uniforms 
and that's where it would go is right on the right above the pocket there and that is where the jump wings would go is right over that so that is what a PIR oval looks like on a uniform okay so mm, these ovals are from the 11th Airborne HQ Command if I remember correctly let's see and these are post-World War II. Uh, one of those things, it's kind of something you learn by. With time. <laughs> and you'll know this is post-World War II when they have the plastic wrap on them like this. I can't remember why they had the plastic on them. Because I've seen these on Vietnam patches on uniforms like that. And without, so... I never claimed to be an expert on patches. I should have opened the video with that, but I, this will definitely give you enough information to at least maybe get you into a little trouble with patches or maybe make you a few bucks, hopefully. Uh, this one, the one I showed you earlier with the green back, that's the 77th Infantry Division in New York State. The Lost Battalion belonged to that unit in World War One. So a lot of people from my state will end up in that unit. Let's see, another good example. This is a shafe patch. I cannot remember what it stands for. Strategic Headquarters, something or other. But these generally come adorned with a Berlin tab to be attached to them. And that's the patch you'll see on Ike's, Ike's jacket, General Eisenhower. These are service stripes. I believe each one of these indicated the two years, two to three service years of service with the army. And this is a style of bullion. I'm sorry, this isn't focusing. But this is a, another style of bullion. That's a bullion, like a metallic thread, much thinner than like you'll see on bullion patches, like so. And there's a Merrill Marauders, and this one's probably a reproduction of some kind. And it's something I can tell kind of more by feel and the black light. I think this is a good black light tester to show you. Here's a neat, really neat one, actually. This is, well, because it's homemade, basically. Hand embroidered. You can just tell by the, the way the wings on there that it's probably hand embroidered. But what this is, High School Victory Corps, air service to be exact, judging from uh, the propellers. The High School Victory Corps was a voluntary organization aimed at the country's more than 6 million students attending some of its over 28,000 high schools was called the High School Victory Corps and was conceived to prepare young Americans for service in the armed forces tomorrow through learning in the classroom today. So that's actually kind of a neat patch. And if well, military, but I, it, I put, uh, I think I got this on my eBay for $75, which the, the, the normal style of this patch, which I've seen, it would be look more like this style, which would be a manufactured mass manufactured style uh so they do exist and uh this is the only one uh, like this i had ever seen so hence it's got a slightly higher price here's a good example of sometimes even if you with all the books and knowledge in the world you don't know what you're looking at sometimes it just sometimes even the experts can be stumped. This is a great example of that. This is for the 517th Parachute Raj Metal Combat Team, like I mentioned earlier, who my uncle fought with during World War II. I bought this from a pretty reputable dealer a few years ago. I paid a lot of money for it. And um, north of a thousand. It came with some other stuff, though, so completely judge me. Now, a real patch like this, and I'm not, I'm not saying this isn't real, but like, I actually, I've actually shown this very patch to the authors of one of those books I showed you before, and it even had them stumped as far as uh, what exactly it could be. Uh, what 
I initially thought it was was an Italian theater made style of the battling buzzards, uh, which is what my uh, eBay store is actually named after. Battling Buzzards Antiques and Military, or Battling Buzzards AM on eBay. Um, attack was their motto. Uh, but what the best the, the Keller said was it could be a reunion piece because it's got a slight glow underneath a, uh, underneath a black light, which I'll show you guys here in a little bit. But not an overly blaring glow like you'll see on most modern fabrics. So it's just one of those anomalies. But I hang on to it as a reminder to uh, do your research. Uh, and, I mean, not like I could sell it as a real, like, I, I'm, I have a reputation I'd like to uphold within the military collecting world. So let's take a look at these under a black light and they'll give you an idea of what i've been talking about black lights for okay we're going dark okay. we're going to start with the ghostbusters no we're not i dropped the light and start with the ghostbusters because that's going to be glowing like crazy and see how that is just glowing like crazy. Let's see. Put something like sweat now. See the difference? See that World War One patch and how when I hit that ghost, it just glows like a real ghost. And when I hit this, it's not nowhere near as bright because the light the, the fabric's more or less absorbing the light rather than reflecting it so that's a good indicator that that's a good real patch now I'll look at these two thing here with the bullion patches i hope this video comes out let's see another great way to tell see how white the ghost is and how the white on those is not blurring at all and let's see what else can we find a good one the problem with the black light test, though, is it primarily works on white uh, thread. It's not going to work on pretty much any other uh, color, unfortunately. So, and it's kind of hard to tell in the video. That's why it's even better to have the Ghostbusters patch. Okay. Now, that's not glowing, but there's other reasons. I believe that's a reproduction. Maybe I could go over in another video. And let's see. There you see. That's what I was talking about. See how the white on that patch is kind of glowing. It's more white than the Ranger Battalion lettering there. So. And another one, let's see how it's reflecting that way back at me. But, and there's a lot of white on this patch, and you don't you see how it doesn't do what my Ghostbusters patch is doing. See? Okay, we're out here in my garage, and because I got some more variants out here on uniforms that I want to give you a look at. Uh, we'll start with this guy here. This is a Port of Embarkation patch. It's not a very valuable patch, but it does have the uh, bullion captain's bars up there. Those look probably theater made of some kind, as well as the uh, bullion service stripes on that jacket. And here we have uh, Air Corps Training Command or Army Air Force or Army Air Corps. Uh, so, and that's a felt version. I think this is a US made felt version. Could possibly also be British. This is a pretty neat jacket as it has Air Force buttons on it. It's an Army jacket. It's a World War II Army jacket, but it's got Air Force buttons on it, which makes me believe it's probably from a transitional period when. The Air Force was segregating itself from the Army and make, becoming its own entity of the Air Force, which I think is pretty neat. That is a second Army patch. 
That is eighth division, and it's from a period where they were designated, or at least a couple of the regiments were designated airborne for one or two years, I think in the early 1950s. So that makes this a pretty rare patch, or fairly rare anyway. It, it's got the integral tab attached to the patch, making it a pretty good one. It's yeah, maybe a $40, $50 patch, but it's a nice uniform with some jump rings. And we got an Air Corps patch, 12th Air Force. Here. This is a nice jacket. It's a name jacket. It's got the uh, lieutenant bars and the pilot wings on there. At the 82nd Air Board, of course, the All Americans, one of the most famous Air Board divisions. Uh, and then we got a 45th Infantry Division here on a really nice HB t shirt with a really nice name tab there, World War II style. And this is kind of unique because somebody added these epaulet onto the shoulder here because normally they don't come like that. And uh, that patch there, it's like a 20, 30, more like a 15 to $20 patch right there. And with some World War II patches, you'll find a variant of uh, divisional patches where the border is olive drab and not the color of the inside of the patch. And that'd be called OD border, of course. And those are pretty sought after. Um, a little bit harder to find. Not They're not all incredibly rare, but they do command a little more money. If this 45th Division one had an OD border, that'd be like a $75 patch, probably. Um, I don't have an embroidered one, but the Air Corps patch, which is like this, but embroidered, is probably one of the most common patches you'll come across out there. But if you ever come across one that's embroidered, embroidered like that, not felt like this, and it has that OD border I was telling you about, buy it now it's uh there it's like a thousand dollar patch if it has the od border the one with the blue border five dollars that border makes a huge difference and we have a first army patch this is a vietnam era jacket i'm gonna show you a good example of a vietnam era theater made patch this patch here ninth infantry division this is Made in country Vietnam. Uh, this division saw a lot of action. Too bad this jacket's not named. But uh, I don't like to take patches off jackets too often. It depends. There's, that's a video for another time talking about removing patches. Um, let's see. There's that bullion. Uh, there's my, oh, right here. Here's a really nice one. 17th Airborne. Here's another variant of the 17th Airborne, anyway. Notice anything different from the one I showed you earlier? Right there. This claw is reversed. On all the other, most patches, the, all of the claws face the same way. In this variant, one claw faces this way. It's called the reverse claw variant. And this also has an integral a tab has a fabric piece holding the two together, which makes this a pretty decent patch. It's probably a 75 between 75 and 150 dollar patch, right there, believe it or not, just because of the claw going a different way. And see how it has an OD border, it's kind of like what I was just talking about. That doesn't impact this one very much because most of these ones have the OD border, that's why I said OD borders. Help some patches. Uh, let's see. Then we go down here. I got some modern versions. That's Desert Storm era. Or, well, that's probably Iraqi Freedom era. That's a nice combat shirt there from a 101st Airborne Soldier. Here we have a Marine Corps patch. Yes, it's on an Army uniform, but this is a New York Guard uh, uniform. And, New York Guard guys come from all walks of life, but uh, this guy was also in the Marine Corps, and if you're in the Marine Corps and you later join the Army, you are allowed to wear your Marine Corps insignia. Uh, and this guy was 1st Marine Division, 
So, but yeah, there's some of the, my uh, garage uniforms for you. See, and there we have it, guys. Uh, like I said, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I've been collecting patches for a long time. I've looked at thousands over the years now. And I know enough to get myself in trouble, like this one. This one's a perfect example of I thought I knew what I was looking at, so I was I threw down the money. So, and that's what you call paying for education, uh, which happens to everybody in the collecting world. So, to keep that from happening to you, I hope this video uh, will keep that from happening. Um... And this is good for resellers, collectors alike, I think. Because patches are, like I said earlier in the video, they're very highly collected. Some are worth thousands. So if you're going to be spending that kind of money or if you think you might be, you know, come across one that could be worth good money, these some of these tips should help you out along the way, I hope. Uh, so you don't make the same mistake I did with one. It's like I... I was so sure you know uh, it was real but you know it happens uh and this was years ago so I, I feel like i'm a little smarter now i hope anyway but um so this is good for collectors and resellers alike i think because it'll help you know to kind of what to keep an eye out for at least with world war ii style patches because even some modern ones can be worth some money from what i understand so uh and vietnam uh, Vietnam patches are very collected now, and I didn't even, I, I mean, I showed you a sort of kind of Vietnam one, but uh, there's, some of those are worth big money too, and again, with theater made, that's a, that's a whole other ball field of uh, style of collecting, so I'm sure you'll come across some in a million, you, something you can come across at yard sales, flea markets, auctions all the time, so... If you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the comments. If I got something wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up if uh, and subscribe. If you like to give me a thumbs down and either way. Um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Hopefully this video gave you a little bit of information uh, about patches. So, catch you next time.